Jesus makes it right Oh well I may have doubts and fears My eyes be filled with tears Oh but Jesus he's a friend Who watches day and night Oh and I just go to him in prayer For he knows my every care And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right Now let us have a little talk
Hallelujah. No longer a slave to fear. You remember whenever you were a slave to fear? Whenever you knew you were lost and damned for eternity? But God convicted your soul and saved you. Could we just lift our hands one more time and thank you? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the redemption of the cross for Calvary, for the blood of Jesus that makes the vilest sinner clean. Thank you, Lord, that we have overcome fear because of what you've done on Calvary. Thank you, Lord, that you have promised and prepared a place for us that when we're absent in this body, we'll be in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for eternity. Thank you for the blessed hope, the church, the rapture that's going to soon take place. Thank you, Lord, for your promises. All your promises are yea and amen. We love you, Jesus. Could you remain standing just for a moment as we go into prayer? Brother Ronnie Brown, he was here Sunday. We're so excited to see him. He's had some heart problems, but he's had to be taken back to the hospital. I want us to bind together and pray for Brother Ronnie. And also our schools, public schools starting, our children that are going in this church or associated with this church, if you're in the public school, they need prayer. They need strength to be a light, a testimony. Also teachers, I know we have teachers in this church that either have taught or are teaching in the public school system. We're going to pray for them. Our Christian school starts next week. And we have a a lot of new students. And then our school of ministry, 30 students will be coming in. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday and getting settled in the dorms. Let's pray. Do you have an unspoken request with an uplifted hand? Lord sees every need. Let's bind together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into the sanctuary one more time. Lord, call upon the name that is above every name. Your name is precious. It's priceless. Lord, I thank you that that name, it still calms every fear. It soothes all the doubts of our heart. Lord, I can call upon the name of the Lord and my faith reaches up and touches you. Miracles can take place. The impossible becomes possible when we call upon the name of the Lord. I cry out to you, Lord, for those in the public school. Let these children be testimonies, lights to a lost and a dying world. For every teacher that's teaching in our school system, Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, to protect them, to keep them in the name of Jesus. Lord, for those that are starting in our Christian school next week, oh God, I pray for an outpouring of your spirit from the very beginning. Touch our children during our classes, our chapel services. Anoint our teachers to teach in Jesus' mighty name. For our school of ministry that's traveling in from all these different locations, Oh, God, give them traveling mercies, protection. Lord, I pray that this year will be the greatest year we've ever had. Pour out your spirit in a mighty way. For every need in this house, Lord, you know about it even before we come to you in prayer. Meet us, oh, God, in this sanctuary tonight. Touch Brother Ronnie Brown. Bring healing to his body. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If our ushers could make their way to the front, receive the evening tithe and offering. Prime Timers meeting, September the 1st in the HTCA gym. Please bring finger foods and desserts. And then once again, um, Harvest Time Christian Academy will start Tuesday, September the 5th. Wednesday meal starting back. Wednesday, September the 6th. That's next week on Wednesday, 545. We'll be starting back our Wednesday meals. Harvest Time School of Ministry will start the following Monday, one week from from next Monday. But they'll be arriving starting Wednesday and then all the way through uh, Friday. We'll have orientation on Saturday. And a lot of their parents will be with us this coming Sunday uh, and just, just being in the service with us. So that'll be a, a good thing. Prime Timers Branson trip, October the 11th through the 14th. We've had a little bit of a price increase, and we'll tell you a little bit about that later on. But we, we've had some trouble getting the right accommodations. I'll just put it to you that way. So um, we'll let you know about that. But we're going to try to do some more fundraisers for our Prime Timers to get everything covered for this Branson trip. We've had such a great time, all the trips that we've been on, and, um, and we want you to go. We want to serve you. You serve us. 
You help us throughout all the year with our youth, with our school ministry, with our Christian school, and we want to serve our senior citizens. Amen? Praise the Lord. Brother Kenneth McDaniel, could you bless the offering? broken from the start helpless left alone in the dark defenseless my life was falling apart hopeless unaware of who you are
That's good. That's good. Thank you, musicians and singers. Before I dismiss our classes, I want to say that we have we've been working hard to get two more houses ready that we've already had that we were using for different purposes, and and so we have now four dorms, two girls' dorms, and two men's dorms for HTSM, and we've built eight bunk beds, which is a total of 16 beds, and, and I'm telling you, we're, we're getting ready for them to come in here, so we're so very thankful for all of you that's helped, and, and uh, we're not going to get, we're barely going to make the finish line next week, so um, if anybody wants to help us next week, rest this week, this is, this is that plug right here this time we're going to dismiss all of our children and teenagers to their classes age 5 to 18. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6. Very familiar portion of Scripture. Ephesians, chapter 6, and verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shall with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together in the midst of this congregation. Where two or three are gathered in your name, you said you are in the midst of those people. Lord, I thank you for the presence and the power of the Spirit of God. Pray, Lord, that the Word of God will become alive to us. We know it's a living Word, but let it become alive to our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us, change our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to preach to you tonight on the simple thought, the armor of God. As you read about current surveys and studies they never cease to amaze me of how many atheists, agnostics, and people who just do not believe in anything to do with the afterlife exist today. As I was reading a survey, a recent survey said that fewer and fewer people believe in a real hell or a real devil. Don't you know that the enemy loves this more than anything else? That people do not believe he exists. Why is this? Because his greatest triumph is causing people to not take him serious. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say to you tonight on the authority of God's holy word that there is a real devil, there's a real heaven, and there's a real hell. And there's certainly a real God who knows how to keep everything in his hand if we will trust in him through faith. Hell is real and the devil is really real. He loves the fact that people do not take him serious. Can we give me a little less monitor up here? His greatest triumph is causing people to not take him serious. Why is this? If people don't take you serious, if they don't 
think that you exist, they are not going to combat your attacks against them. Listen here, I'm here to remind you that there are real demons, there's a real devil, and there are real hell's forces to destroy us. And you and I must not be ignorant to his devices. I'm here to tell you and remind you, the Bible says he goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking to whom he may devour. He wants to destroy you. He's got a target on you. He's got a target on this church. He has a target on your family. So what do we do? We've got to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The Bible says a lot about the devil, Satan, Lucifer. There's a lot of names given to him. He first appears in the book of Genesis chapter 3, and the last time we see him is in Revelation chapter 20. He has many titles. I cannot name them all. But he's called Satan. He's called the devil. He's called the old serpent. He's called the deceiver. He's also called the old dragon, the evil one, the accuser of the brethren. Listen, everything the Bible says about him is true. He's a real devil. Every New Testament writer mentions him. Jesus encountered him at the beginning and the end of his ministry and spoke of him. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying he's real. You may not be able to see him with a natural eye, but I can tell you he's roaming about. Demons are roaming about, and they ever live to seek and destroy God's creation. Ladies and gentlemen, a third of the angels fell with him whenever he decided to come against God. So we're fighting demonic forces on every side. A third fell with him. Are you with me? I'm telling you, I believe it's billions or maybe millions or billions of angels but I've got good news for you two thirds are still with us there's more with us than it is with hell you and I have victory if we'll take it because God is on our side the devil is real So please heed my warning tonight. If we're going to overcome, we better come God's way and follow God's plan. He's given us access to every single thing that you and I need tonight to win in this spiritual warfare. If we're to overcome, we must take on the whole armor of God. If you're in a Christian tonight, if you're a Christian, you are on the front lines of battle. You are on the front lines of battle and we can't wait for the bad guy to attack us. We've got to attack him. Shortly after the terror attacks of 9-11, military strategists developed the concept of forward-leaning defense. What does that mean? That means you don't wait for the enemy to come to you. You go to him. I've always, listen, I'm not against fighting. I'm glad the kids are out of here. But I can tell you, my, I've always been taught, throw the first lick in a fight. Uh, you'll get the advantage. And that's exactly how we, as the children of God, have got to do. Uh, we can't just be on the defense. If you'll notice the Bible in Ephesians chapter 6, none of that armor is for the back. Uh, it's always for the front. Why is that? Uh, because the Christian is never to retreat in battle. We're always to go forward. Uh, David said we're to run through the troop and leap over the wall. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, we are not to run in battle, but you and I are to go forward. uh, And we are to go forward with the full armor of God. When Satan comes to attack, he doesn't come with the appearance of a devil. No, he's not like that. He comes cunning and crafty in his approach. The Bible even says he comes as an angel of light. He comes so cunning and crafty and and deceptive. And one of Satan's most successful yet insidious forms of attack is discouragement. Have you been discouraged? Have you been under the weather spiritually? And you're just, you, I mean, we all go through things in life that discourage us. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in that place where I have to come out of that discouraged valley. I have to encourage myself in the Lord. And listen, there's a lot of things that can discourage you. But I'm going to tell you from the onset of this message today, discouragement, oh, from what you have done or what you didn't do and how your family's treating you and how things have ended up and how they're working out right now. Listen to me today. 
today. Uh, discouragement can set in on any of us, uh, but you got to get out of that thing. I'm speaking to somebody in this house today. Uh, you've been discouraged all week long. Uh, well, you got to learn to do what David did. Encourage yourself in the Lord. It's not as bad as what you think it is. Uh, I'm telling you, uh, I don't care how bad it is. Uh, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, I'm on my way to heaven. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I live a good life. Uh, God has been good to me. Uh, one day on top of the ground is better than three days underneath the ground. Are you with me today? Uh, I don't have anything to complain about uh, because God is a good God. Uh, are you discouraged today? Well, it's time to encourage yourself in the Lord uh, because every single trial has an exp expiration date just like milk has an expiration date. Uh, you're coming out of it soon. Uh, just hold on to God's unchanging hand. Discouragement is one of his greatest tools. But I want to tell you he's a liar. He's a deceiver. He is a diabolical angel of light with a thousand disguises tempting you on every side. But listen, he's smarter than we are, but I've got one on the inside called the Holy Ghost of God who brings all things to my remembrance, what Christ has said. And listen, God will unravel Satan's plans. I can get this spirit without measure and get the discernment of the Lord. Let me remind you of another important fact in this warfare. Our battle is not against people. Man, we get this so wrong so often. We get mad at people. We get mad at the abortionists. I understand. We, our minds can't even wrap around how somebody would murder a child or the pornographers and, and how it's sweeping the internet more than ever before. And I gave you the stats several weeks ago and, and how it's destroying souls and marriages and people. Or we get mad at the godless politicians or the corrupt businesses or the drug dealers that, that push drugs and, and many have overdosed. And Listen to me, I understand how, how we can get angry with those kind of people, but my Bible says we're not fighting against flesh and blood. That is, these people are not the source of the problem. Uh, what is the source of the problem, preacher? I can tell you it's principalities and powers uh, and rulers of darkness of this world. Uh, listen, those people that are bound, uh, that are being driven by the powers of hell, what they need is deliverance by the power of the cross. Uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, I don't believe that uh, just about anybody is too far beyond help from God. Uh, well, we just got to give them the answer to salvation. Ephesians 6 and 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Listen to me, but we are wrestling against a real satanic attack. Let me ask you a question. Are you under attack tonight? Do you feel like you're under satanic attack? Do you feel like your family's under satanic attack? Let me give you a few examples of what satanic attack looks like. Are you ready? I'm going to give you some examples. Now, there's a whole lot more than what I'm about to name. But these are some of the symptoms Unusual are repeated temptations where you're constantly being tempted. Attacks from an unexpected quarter. Whenever you're going along in life and just getting it in ways you never did before. Delays that hinder us from obeying God's word. How about this one, number four, inducements to doubt God's word. There are people that are coming with, to me with questions constantly about the basics of of scripture. Listen, on every side, you're going to hear people say, well, what, is that really true? Did God really do this? You're going to hear more uh, false theology about the word of God and about how old the earth is. Are, are you with me? Uh, and all of these things than ever before. Here's another one. You know you're under satanic attack. Circumstances that produce unusual pressure upon us. Or what about temptations to sin in areas that never troubled us before? Or what about prolonged bouts of discouragements? Or worries that seem to consume us? Or seducive appeals to sinful compromise? Or bitterness towards others? Excuses made, here's another one, 
for lack of spiritual growth. And I mean, I, I could write down many, many more of things that can happen to you constantly that are from the enemy. Listen, when we face these temptations, we need to make sure that Satan has us in his crosshairs. Now listen, I'm not saying this to you tonight to get you to fear, for we don't have to fear the enemy. But I want to tell you, we can never let our guard down. The enemy is constantly going after us. He is constantly trying to destroy your marriage. He's constantly trying to destroy your children. He's constantly trying to get inside where he can cause damage in your home or in your spiritual life. You must be on guard. You must be sober. You must be vigilant. You must be always ready. And you must be looking for him all the time and everywhere because he's coming all the time. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Oh, church, I don't know what I would do without the power of the Spirit, the third person of a triune Godhead who lives and operates and shows me the attacks of the enemy. Amen. Hear me. That's exactly what the moment we need to put on the whole armor of God when we're under these type of attacks. Ephesians 6, 14 through 17 makes it clear how we should fight back against the devil. Paul paints a picture of a Christian in complete armor. The first one is the belt of truth. The second one, the breastplate of righteousness. Then he says the shoes, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and then the sword of the Spirit. Now, I want to say, before I go through each piece of armor, I want to say each piece of armor describes a spiritual trait that the believer needs to survive against the attacks of the enemy. Listen to me today. You cannot just have part of the armor on. You've got to have all of the armor of the Lord upon. Number one, the belt of truth. Listen, the belt held the soldier's uniform in place. And without the belt, they could not move quickly. Now, as I'm preaching this, you've got to picture a Roman soldier... You got it, and we've seen them before. We've seen a description of what they look like. The belt held everything together. Listen to me. The truth of God's word still holds everything together. Oh, listen, we wouldn't have anything. This would be nothing more than a religious country club without the belt of truth. What are you standing on, preacher? I'm standing on the word of God. It may not look good in society. It may be, I may be going through hell. I may be going through the battle, but I'm standing on the word. And that word is a belt of truth that holds everything everything else together. This is what held everything in the uniform in place for the soldier. Without the belt, he could not move quickly and he could not move at all. If he could not move quickly, he could not fight. The belt of truth refers to the truth God has revealed in his word. Listen, when you're discouraged, when you're under attack, you got to go back to the things that you know to be true. True. Truth. The basics, the foundation. Listen, we all go through things that our minds come up with these ingenious ideas. Or you hear something talked about through another source at work. Or you see something on the internet that causes a doubt to be put into your mind. Listen to me. you got to go back to the things that are fundamental, and that is in the Word of God. What's those fundamental things? Number one, God is a holy God. Number two, God is a righteous God. Oh, he's perfect in every way, and his ways are always right. These are fundamental things. Give me another fundamental thing. His mercy endures forever. Oh, here's another fundamental thing. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Here's another fundamental thing. Oh, he, there's only one way to salvation, and it's through Jesus. Here's another fundamental thing. We are kept by the love of God, and we we are sealed by the Spirit of God. What are you saying, preacher? What does this have to do with the belt of truth? What It has everything to do with it because we got to get back to the foundational 
fundamental things when you are in the battle of your life. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the Word of God that's going to keep you. It's the Word of God that's going to hold everything together. The Word of God is still truth. It's still right. It's still living. It gets on the inside of the marrow of my bones. I'm going to tell you it produces life and life more abundantly. you got to go back to the fundamentals, the basics of Christianity. I tell the story that I heard from Brother J.D. and Sister Charlotte, Brother Scott, about their son that passed away several years ago with cancer. He, he loved the Lord, and, and towards the end of his life, when he was on hospice, he was on certain types of medication to take the pain away. And Brother Scott would tell the story that he would start to be confused about things. His mind would just go to places because of that medicine. And he said, uh, he, he began to ask Scott, is this going on? And Brother Scott said, no, it's not. And, and he, he was confused. And, and his brother looked at him and he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stick to the things that I know that I know. Man, I want to tell you, when he told me that for the first time, I said, say that one more time. He said, my brother said, I'm going to stick to the things that I know that I know. What was he saying? I'm going to stick to the things I learned all in the word from my mom and dad, from my grandmother, from that old Sunday school teacher. I'm going to stick to the basics. I may not understand everything and I may not see everything the way I used to see it because of the condition I'm in, but what I'm going to go back to is the fundamental basics of the Bible because the Bible is always right. I'm going to stick to the things that I know, that I know is right. What is right, preacher? Uh, the truth of God's word. Put that belt around you in the midst of this wicked, perverse, deceived nation uh, and get a hold of God and you will hold everything else together. Number two, the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate covered the vital organs of the chest, especially the heart. It was like an ancient bulletproof vest. The righteousness Paul had in mind was the virtue of right relationship with God. The righteousness of God. The breastplate of righteousness. Listen to me today. We must be in right relationship with God. And I mean turning from sin and not, not walking in something that you know is not right. What are you saying preacher? I'm saying this. You will have no power in your life unless you have purity in your life. I said you will have no power in your life unless you have purity in your life. Listen, it's the breastplate of righteousness. When you're in the battle... You will not win against the attacks of hell if there's hidden sin, if there's things that are there that are not supposed to be there. No purity, no power. Listen to what Solomon says in Proverbs 28 and 1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. I want you to think about that. He said, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Whenever you know you're right with God, it's not a prideful thing. It's not saying, look at me because I'm holy, because our righteousness is as filthy rags. But when I'm walking in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, when I know I'm right, when I've got every sin under the blood, oh, come on, I'm as bold as a lion. Why? because I know the devil is subject to me because greater is he who is in you and I than he that is in the world. Get everything under the blood, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to tell you, you will have power. When we compromise morally or spiritually, it's like a soldier standing uncovered before the enemy. Let me say that again. When we compromise morally or spiritually, it is like you and I being open, uncovered before the enemy. The choices are made, the choices we make either fortify us against Satan or they make us easy prey before Satan. You're either fortified or you're easy prey according to your choices. 
Listen, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a free moral agent man because I know that according to this Bible, you can read it from Genesis to Revelation and you'll find out that we're people that make choices. Uh, I, I, I don't have to sin every day. I don't have to be bound by sin. I have a choice. Uh, listen, whenever the Spirit of God lives within you, whenever He is dominant in control of your life, what does the Holy Ghost do? The Spirit of God. Whenever something comes across that TV, the Spirit says, you change that right now. Uh, he may even tell you to get the thing out the house or whatever he tells you to do you do whatever the Holy Ghost says the spirit makes uh, he communicates with my spirit man tells the soul which is the mind to turn that thing to turn your head to go a different direction it is a choice ladies and gentlemen I'm talking to you about the breastplate of righteousness I have a choice to go to the drugstore to, to, to go get drugs or alcohol or to come commit adultery. I must walk in the light as he is in the light. I'm talking about a warfare. If you want to win the battle, you must be separated and holy unto God. Number three, the shoes of the gospel of peace. A soldier must have good shoes so he can fight without slipping. They say that the Roman soldiers, they would drive spikes through the bottom of their feet. Now, it wouldn't go up into their feet, but spikes so they could keep their footing in battle. If you don't have good footing in battle, you're going to lose the battle. When Paul speaks of the gospel of peace, he means the gospel itself is the only true source of peace. We need to put on the shoes, the gospel of peace. Oh, the peace of God he gives us in the midst of the battle. Christians ought to be the calmest people on the planet. I have seen people just about have a nervous breakdown when something happens. I'm talking about whenever something in the government happens, when, whenever uh, the Twin Towers were attacked. Brother Taylor said, he told me, he said, a lady came in here. Now, this was back in, was it 2001? The Twin Towers were attacked. And he said, this lady, she, she was the most spiritual lady in the church. She liked to manifest, give messages in tongues. But whenever the towers were attacked, she ran in this sanctuary and she said, Brother Taylor, we're all going to die. He said, woman, get a hold of yourself. And that's not any reflection on a woman. It could have happened to a man too. But I'm going to tell you, uh, we ought to be the most calm people on the planet. Why is that? Uh, because listen to me, I'm sealed until the day of redemption. There is blood. You can't see it right now, but the blood of Calvary's lamb uh, has been applied to my sin sick soul. Uh, it doesn't matter what happens to me. Uh, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord. Let me say it again. Uh, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord that ought to give somebody else in this house some peace I'm talking about the gospel of peace there is no panic in heaven no matter what happens on earth the devil will do all he can to distract us with fear don't succumb to the threatenings of the enemy because we have the gospel of peace when fear threatens to overwhelm you, you need to put your shoes on. Amen? The shield of faith. The shield of faith describes what we might call dependent living. The shield of faith. He said, wherewith it, you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Listen, our faith is under constant attack. If he can get you to not believe what God says, if he can get you to doubt God's word, if he can get you to doubt what God has... Listen, again, let me go back to the previous statement. I'm going to stick to the things that I know that I know. And that goes back to standing on the word of God, believing God. If he can get you to doubt that God is real, that God has you a, a, a future home prepared for you, that he's going to take care of you. Listen to me. The enemy has 
shows you exactly where he wants you. The fiery darts of the wicked are thoughts that come into your mind. They are attacks that come against you. They are to get you to doubt God. They are to get you to have unbelief that begins to grow in that heart. What do we do when the enemy shoots his, he hurls his weapon and his darts against us? We hold up the shield of faith. We quote the word of God. Oh, come on. Faith still comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Do you want some supernatural faith tonight? Read the word of God. Meditate on the word of God and do the word of God. Your faith will arise like you've never dreamed before and you'll begin to believe God. You'll believe God for miracles. The shield of faith. Fiery darts of the wicked. And then there's the helmet of salvation. The helmet protects the soldier's head. Woe to the soldier who goes into battle without the helmet. He won't last long when the enemy begins firing from the other side. The helmet of salvation speaks of our security in Christ. The helmet of salvation. The enemy ever told you you're not saved? Am I the only one that he's told that to? Am I the only one that he's lied to and tried to get me to give up? Listen, Pentecostal people are some of the worst people succumbing to the false accusations of the enemy. Listen, I would rather live on the... uh, You know, Jesus said, strive to enter in the straight gate. I've heard people say, well, don't worry about it. You got this. You got saved as a child. It's okay. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, strive to enter in. For many will seek to, seek to enter in and shall not be able. Wide is the gate, broad is the way. What are you trying to say? I'm not saying that it's a work salvation. I'm not saved by my works. I'm saved by the precious blood of, what, of Jesus Christ, what he did on Calvary. But hear me today. My salvation, we, I'm not going to allow the enemy to accuse me. I'm not going to allow him to accuse me of my past. Listen to me. But I must walk in purity today. I can tell the devil, yeah, that's exactly what I was before. Yes, everything you say is the truth. That's exactly what I did. But thanks be unto God. He has removed my sin as far as the east is from the west. I'm not a participant any longer. I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I am saved. I am being saved. And I'm going to be saved as long as I walk in the light as he is in the light. Listen, if you fail, get to that altar, repent, and make it right with God. I'm going to tell you, according to this Bible right here, he'll forgive you. That's the kind of God that we have. Ladies and gentlemen, the helmet of salvation, put it on. It is our security in Christ. Then it's the sword of the Spirit. Can someone come to the piano? He says, finally, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the only offensive weapon for the child of God. All the other armor protects the soldier during an attack. But the word of God is our offensive weapon that cuts like a double-edged sword, laying everything bare so that nothing is hidden. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, The word of God is quick. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vine asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God. That's why Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and he responded to the devil by quoting Scripture. Nothing defeats our adversary like quoting the Bible. As long as you're living according to the Bible. You can't quote it and not live it and have power and have this as an offensive weapon. But nothing is more detrimental to our enemy than quoting and living the Word of God. Whenever Jesus was being tempted, he said, Satan, it is written. Mm. It is written. Mm. Everything else is defensive. It's to protect But the Word of God is an offensive. Listen, remember, forward-leaning defense is not sitting out there waiting for the enemy to attack you. We go after the enemy. It's time, it's time that the church stop playing defense all the time. We're not on the defense. 
We're on the offense. We can go after the enemy. We ought to go after the enemy that's going after our family. We ought ought to go after the enemy that's going after our marriage or after our friends or whatever the situation that you see that there's a spiritual warfare going on. Don't play defense and wait for the enemy to hit you. Go after him. That's what the Word of God does. When a man of God or a woman of God has the Word of God, they have the power of God. Meditate on the Word of God. Memorize the Word of God. And that Word will become powerful to you. Then he tells us to pray in the Spirit. Listen, whether you want it or not, you are a child of God enlisted in the army of God. We are on the battlefield. We are on the front lines. You say, well, I'm tired. Well, you can rest when you get to heaven. I'm tired too. I'm physically, sometimes I just feel like, man, I don't know if I can push through. But then, you know what I've learned to do? Just put one foot in front of the other. How do you climb that mountain? Just one step at a time. How do you get through the day? You get through the day by pressing on each minute, each hour, and you don't give up. The problem with us is we look at the big picture, we look too far down the road, and we get discouraged. Oh, no, there's no way I can do that. That's just too big. That's too long. That's... Not with what I'm already experiencing. There's no way that I can last until the end. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. I've had young preachers say, Brother Matt, you preach all these messages. How do you get these messages? I say, one message at a time. <laughs> there ain't no way. I, there's just no way. Everything we do is one step at a time, one day at a time. That's how we win the battle. When I got saved in 1996, I was so afraid that I would not be able to stop drinking alcohol. I'd been drinking since I was 14 years old. I was 20 when I got saved. My mom did not approve it. She did not know it. She knew it, but it was behind her back. My dad. And I I was addicted as a 20-year-old to alcohol. When I got saved in 1996... I refused. This is for somebody tonight. This is, this is applicable, not just for people drinking alcohol. This is applicable for every temptation that comes against your mind. I, I learned very quickly, very early, to cast down every imagination. This is the key to spiritual warfare. The number one key, and this is, this is the basis of spiritual warfare, is cast down that imagination and replace it with another thought. I was... I was addicted to alcohol. Got saved in 1996, and I was so afraid that if I thought about it within 60 seconds, my heart would, that, that lust that James says, when every man is tempted, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, that word tempted is not just being tempted, but it, it actually means in that text to, to fall to the temptation. But every man was tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it goes from here to here, It brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. And I can remember being a young man just saved. I said, okay, I can never allow it to go from here to here. So God taught me something. Early in my walk with God, He taught me to cast down that imagination because thoughts are going to come. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin when thoughts come in your mind, whether it's through the flesh, whether your own flesh is conjuring up the thought, or if it's the devil. It's not a sin to be tempted. Here's where it becomes a a sin. Whenever you go past three or four seconds, you got to learn to cast down that imagination and immediately trade it with another thought. So here's what I did. Let me just tell you the, the very simple thing that I did. An, a, a, a picture of Budweiser long neck bottle would come to my mind. My whole heart would start beating. I'd cast that imagination down and I'd start thinking about what I just read about Jesus. On, he was on this, he was preaching, 
Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And I was, I was thinking about the loveliness of the Savior. I was thinking about how He died on the cross for me and how He made me feel. And I refused to think on that temptation. That's the basis of spiritual warfare. And it's applicable. It works for everything. Are you fearful? Are you angry? Do you have unforgiveness in your spirit? There's so many things that we struggle with, that we deal with, that we could get victory over if we would learn to cast down that imagination and fill our mind with the thoughts of God. Listen, in the battle, in warfare, I told someone here recently because they had been thinking, a very strong Christian that I know had been thinking thoughts. I said, you can't even, those are killer thoughts. If you allow those thoughts to linger too much in that mind, it goes from here to here. Let me, let me quote it again. But every man is tempted. He falls to sin when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That word conceived is a, it's the same word that we get the word pregnant from. The seed, that, that thought, that seed of whatever it is goes from here to here. It impregnates that heart. It conceives in the heart, the very center core of a human being. And it ends up producing a baby. And that baby's an ugly baby. It's an ugly baby. It's a real ugly baby. sinful baby and you got to take care of that sinful baby you better deal with it in its infancy and that goes before it ever goes from here to here whatever it is whatever it is deal with it right here this is the basis of spiritual warfare can we stand he says take on the whole armor of God there's six different things that he says you got to do five are defensive five are defensive and I, I said only one of them is offensive but let me just go ahead and say two of them is offensive. The sword of the Spirit is an offensive weapon and prayer is an offensive weapon. So we put on the whole armor of God as a defense. We never do this. Now this is the battle in front of me. I'm moving towards the battle. God never intended you and I to do this. Are you going to get shot in the back? The enemy is going to hurl a fiery dart and he's going to get you right in the center. The battle is for you and I to always move forward in the things of God. We have Christ ever living to make intercession for every one of us. Can we come and find a place to pray around these altars? Here's what I want to ask you to pray. Unless the Lord's speaking specifically about something in your life. I want you to ask the Holy Ghost to really drive it deep within your heart, your spirit tonight. About every piece of that armor and for you to pay attention and for you to take it on in your life the enemy's just looking for a vulnerable area where he can end up destroying you he just wants to find that place that's vulnerable he just wants to find that little that little spot that he can put an arrow through let us take on the whole armor of God peace of God Cover me, cover me, cover me, peace of God, cover me, through the storm, cover me, oh please.
that are praying, please keep praying. But I I have to share one last thing with you. If I could just convey this and and really relate the importance of what I just said in closing this message out. That the basis of spiritual warfare, if you learn this, what I'm telling you right now, you'll be a victorious child of God. But if you don't, you're going to be in constant defeat and pain and agony and you could lose your soul. If you can learn what I just now said about the basis of spiritual warfare, it works in every area. Every area. Let me give you an example. I just now used alcohol. And I said to you that James says, lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. If I was to think about that beer long enough, I promise you, I promise you, I'd have been born, I was a born again Christian. I mean, transformed by the power of God. People would see me that seen me before I got saved and said, there's no possible way. It's humanly impossible. I've had people say that. Not you. There's no way. I'm telling you, even the born again experience, if I was to let my life, my mind meditate long enough on that what had me before, I'd end up going back to it and it's all with my thought life. Okay? It's, it works with cigarettes, tobacco, any form, drugs. It works with the victim mentality. They, I'm, I'm not fitting in over there. You know how many people the devil says that you don't fit in at HTC? Stop believing that junk. I, I've had to talk more people into staying, and people disagree with me for doing that. I'm like, that's a lie out of the pit of hell. 
You do fit in here. The devil's a liar. Stop allowing your mind to go there with, do I fit in? And I, I just, I don't know. And It's garbage. Or what about this? What about, it works, it works with forgiveness. They hurt you. They did you wrong. And you're sitting there meditating on it. You know something? I'm not, I'm not going to poison myself with that junk. That's poison. You know what I'm going to do whenever the, the enemy or my flesh, because it could be one of the two, brings back a memory of pain that someone did to me. You know what I'm going to do? I'm like, I'm not going to drink that poison. You drink that poison, you get sick. You drink that poison, you die. So what do I do? I immediately, I cast it down. You say, well, I can't control my thoughts, preacher. That's not true. God had never told us to pull down every, or cast down every imagination, pull down every stronghold. Amen? He had never told us to do it if we could not do it, if he did not give us the grace and the power to do it. We got to stop thinking those thoughts. I'm not preaching the power of positive thinking. That's not what I'm preaching. I'm preaching on biblical principles that are in the word of God. You think on it long enough, you become it. Proverbs Proverbs says, For whatever a man thinketh on in his heart, so is he. You think on it long enough and you will become that. You're a critical person. I will rebuke critical people. If they keep if I if I hear long, I'm gonna stop being negative. Stop it. Stop being negative. And then I'll tell them what my mommy used to tell me. If you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. Everything's critical. Everything's bad. You know what's wrong? You got a thinking problem. You need to get your thinking right. Think on good things. Well, Brother Matt, I'm going through hell. You don't know the pain that I'm going through. Listen, I I, I know that it's bad, but I can tell you it's 99% good if you're a child of God. God has the final word. He has the final say. And everything you're going through, everything you're going through, it stops and starts right here. I can tell you why I'm not depressed. I thank God, and and I'm going to be very careful. Oh, Lord, I want to be very humble before you. I'm a very optimistic, upbeat. Half glass is about 99% full all the time. Sometimes to a fault. I just, I mean, everything's so good. Everything's so wonderful. My wife says, hey, hey, you who? That does not look as good as what you think it does. But I would rather be like that than always thinking negative. I just can never get ahead. I'm, our finances are so bad. We can barely pay attention right now. Well, thank God. Thank God that you have food to eat. You have a roof over your head. Life's not bad. For the poorest among us, for the one going through the greatest trial, life is not bad. You need to get your thought life right. Cast down every imagination. I close with this. The basis of spiritual warfare is trading one thought for another. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Could we stand? Father, I thank you for the love of God. I thank you for the word of God. Lord, help us to understand the basis of spiritual warfare is casting down every imagination, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Lord, you want us to be healthy. You want us to be vibrant. You want us, Lord, to have the joy of the Lord. Help us to get our thoughts right. Help us, Holy Ghost. Convict us when every thought is in its infancy. In the name of Jesus, we love you, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Harvest Time Church, for being faithful. You are the most faithful church I've ever seen in my whole life. We love you so much.